Oh, jeepers. You're listening to Smash or Pass with JB, Millie, and Smash. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another video on the JB Hello. and Millie channel. Today, as always, we have with us Smash. Hello. And Rihanna. Hi. And we also have the privilege today of speaking to Kent Bader. Hello. Now, Kent Bader is the absolute genius behind the editing of the first two live action Scooby-Doo movies, which I think is really prominent right now, especially that the first one is coming up to its 20th anniversary this year. So we're really excited to be speaking with you about that. Cool. Yeah, happy to talk to, to you guys. Thank you so, so much. It is an absolute honor. And so I guess we'll start off by um, gaining a bit of knowledge about your career and your background in that, um, how did you become an editor in the first place? I, I uh, went to film school in Boston at Boston University and I became really interested in editing and so I came to LA and I, that's what I decided to focus on and um, I got a job uh, working with John Cassavetes who was an independent filmmaker yeah and uh, on a film called Opening Night and that was my first uh, film job and I was delivering film at the lab one day because everything was shot on film in those days and I heard someone saying they were dropping off for Roger Corman so I started a conversation with her. When I finished with Cassavetes, that led to me working on Rock and Roll High School for Corman. And out of that, I formed a lot of friendships with people who I, you know, I'm still friends with to this day. And went on to work with them a lot and do other projects as well. So, yeah. That's great. And you have, you know, you've edited some incredible movies. And I just wanted to know, is there one that you're particularly proud of or that you enjoyed the most? Uh, there's a lot actually that I really like a lot and had great experiences on. Gremlins 2 is one of my favorites. That was just a, so much fun to work on. And uh, Inner Space as well, both directed by Joe Dante. Um, Spinal Tap was an incredible experience. And uh, my first big studio picture was a, a movie called Fright Night, which I really like a lot. I think it's, I, I really enjoy seeing that when I see it. So yeah, that's, that's like a handful right there. I have worked with Billy Crystal a lot too, and I, he's he's a great guy. So nice, exciting. So, what are some of the major challenges that you face editing a movie? Editing any movie or a particular movie? Yeah, just in general. Um, I mean, I really enjoy it. it it's um, I read the script. And then I have a pretty good idea in my head of how I think it should play. And then uh, the footage starts coming in. At that point, I abandon the script because it's taking out a life of its own. Mm -hmm. And when I cut, I cut scene by scene. And as I'm cutting the scene, I'm keeping in mind, you know, what I read and how I think it should play as a scene and also within the context of the entire movie. So, uh, you know, and you're always looking for the best performances and if it's a comedy, the best laughs. You know, it's the drama, the most dramatic parts, whatever, scary parts. And um, so you're working scene by scene, and then eventually all the scenes are strung together, and you look at it as a movie for the first time. Usually I look at it with the director, because I've done my first cut, and we look at it together. And at that point, we jump in and tackle it as what it is, you know. No matter what was on the page or what was intended, whatever, it is what it is. Right. And then we jump in and we make it better. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of times it's it's too long, or there's certain characters that aren't working the way you intended, or there's any number of challenges that you deal with. And then uh, uh, when you're working on a studio film, especially a big budget film, you have to go through the whole preview process, and that's probably the most challenging part because you show it to an audience and they react, and you can learn a lot. You know, things that you thought we're going to work a certain way, maybe don't always work that way. Usually they do, but once in a while you, you really learn something. And and that's uh, that was the experience on Scooby-Doo. Mm. We had a uh, pretty bad first preview, and, but we can get into that. Uh, that's amazing. And I guess following on, you've worked on so many different movies and especially different genres. So is there a particular genre of movie that you prefer editing for? Yeah, I love comedy. Comedy is my favorite. I just really enjoy it. And I, you know, you have to have a certain sense of rhythm for comedy that's different from other movies. I mean, I love cutting action and I've cut a lot of action and that's really fun too, but comedy is really satisfying, you know, and I love 
one of the things I really love about comedy is that you can break so many rules when you're doing a comedy. And uh, I especially love really anarchic and absurd comedy. That really appeals to me. So yeah, I really, I really enjoy that. And that's why, you know, I think we well, us a lot because we're both kind of on the same page in terms of that kind of approach, you know. But I've done lots of different comedies and, and you know, animated and yeah. That's incredible because obviously um, you've done quite a few comedies that we can see here. And you've also done quite a lot of um, movies involving CGI characters such as Yogi Bear. And of course, we're here to talk about the 20th anniversary for Scooby-Doo. So um, I was wondering if editing a movie that relies on primarily CGI for main characters differs from editing for a movie with, I guess, on-screen actors for main characters. Yeah, I've, I've been through... <clears throat> I've been through a whole process in terms of the evolution of visual effects. You know, when I started out, we were cutting on film. And there was no CGI. Um, there were miniatures. There was, you know, blue screen at the time and different things like that. So, for instance, when I was doing Inner Space, um, we would cut a, a sequence that was ultimately going to be a VFX sequence and using storyboards or background plates. And you have to use your imagination. Okay, like, how long would this take to happen within this shot? And where is the shot going? What should the next shot be? So you're kind of like mapping it out that way. But there were no animatics or anything like that back in the day. So it was really just a question of instinct and timing. And we would turn those sequences over to, you know, in, in the case of Interspace, Industrial Light Magic. And they would give us back shots that were frame to frame, the identical length of what we had given them, you know? Um, so it was a real tight collaboration. And then um, CG started coming in and it was kind of, you know, similar in, in that there were background plates and there were often like some kind of visual reference, like a puppet or like a green ball on a stick or something like that. And, uh, but it was still, okay, What's happening here? <laughs> Especially if it, if it was an action scene, if there's dialogue and the CG character is talking, that's much more straightforward. You're cutting to them talking or reacting, whatever. But if it's action, it's a whole different kind of way to kind of conceive it with, with nothing there. Um, and then eventually, uh, yeah, it, they started getting more into sophisticated animatics. So, so it was like pre-visualizing the sequences. So a lot of times I would cut those animatics and it would give you a pretty good roadmap of how the scene itself was going to end up. And then um, eventually, yeah, I was asked to consult on some animated films in New York for a company called Blue Sky. I, I consulted on a movie called Robots and, and one called Horton Hears a Who. And um, that was a real eye opener. That was a whole different way of approaching editing because um, it was kind of like anything goes with the, with the CG slash live action movies. You're still locked into what was shot. But in an animated film, you know, you have the artist in the next room, you can say, hey, can you draw me a close up <laughs> or whatever that you need? Um, and you can rewrite, revoice, lots of flexibility. So that's been kind of the evolution, you know? And now, um, you know, you look at movies like the latest Spider-Man and, and the line between animation and live action is getting, you know, thinner and thinner. So it's, it's, been, it's been very interesting to see that all evolve. That's amazing. Thank you so much. And I think, like you say, it's really interesting to hear about how the processes are different for animation as well. And one scene that was coming to my head when you were talking about having to edit in a character almost and where they'd be from the 2002 movie was um, the scene where Scooby's sat in the chair and Mr. Emil Monteveris is having to walk around him. I was like, in my head, I was like thinking what the, you know, editing process of that would have had to have been for lining it up just to kind of try and work out from where his eye line was what was going on so yeah I imagine that that really was a process so kind of on um, Scooby-Doo I was curious to know you know before you were doing this project was Scooby-Doo something that you were brought up around did you watch any Scooby-Doo growing up at all? No I didn't actually I didn't I, I mean I, I was aware of Scooby-Doo but I never actually watched the show um, I had worked with a director on a movie called Big Mama's House. So that's how we knew each other. And they were getting ready to do Scooby-Doo. And he asked me to do it. And I was, you know, very excited to do it, especially because it was filming in Australia, which I had never, I'd never been to Australia. And that was a great opportunity. Um, so, but no, I never seen the show and I never watched the show at that time. I just sort of 
kind of picked up on the vibe, you know, and I had the script, <laughs> but, but I didn't refer back to the cartoon, you know. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so then more into that movie. Um, I mean, you. I guess you kind of already told us how you came to work on it, but um, I guess how exactly did that uh, come to fruition, you working on this film? Yeah, we went to Australia. I think it was in January of 2001, and we were there till like March or April, something like that. Mm-hmm for like four or five months and we were based on the gold coast of australia which is just south of brisbane on the east coast and um there's a studio there uh warner road show i think it is and 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 most of it's filmed there some of the island sequences were shot on an island called tangaluma Mm. and there was like incredible production design from bill bows crazy sets (laughs) just really really fun Mm -hmm. And then we came back to the States and we were working in, and, um, at, on the lot at Warner Brothers. And um, 9-11 happened while we were there. And that was really intense because um, after 9-11, there was all this paranoia and people thought that the, well, that the, some of the movie studios had been targeted for an attack. So we were constantly being warned about what to watch out for. And, you know, they stopped traffic coming onto the lot. It was kind of crazy for a while. But, um, you know, the, uh, the whole process of shooting was really fun. And I had a great time checking out those sets. And I had a great time with Matt Lillard, such a good guy. And um, just trying a blank, Velma. Linda you know, Carlini. Linda, yeah. fantastic. Just such a great person. And, uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, it was good times. Nice. And how early in the process were you brought into it? Oh, right from the start. Okay. That's, that's how I work. I, you know, I'm there from the first day of shooting on. Okay. Nice. Part of that is because, you know, I'm cutting as they go along. When they finish the scene, I'm cutting. Mm. So they, they miss something or if I feel they need to get something additional, I can tell them right away. Yeah. You know? And, you know, the director and I tend to look at dailies together. We look at the day's, previous day's footage and talk about it and things like that. Nice. All right. Yep. That's really cool. And I know we touched on this a little bit in the beginning, but the first movie is well known for being very heavily edited after the first negative test screening. Yeah. Why are you the one who edited the then completed movie into the format that we then saw in the theaters when it was first coming out? Yes, I can tell you that story. Um, when I first talked to Raja, the director, about doing the movie, he said, this isn't just going to be a kid's movie. We're designing this to appeal to all ages, to the parents who used to watch it when they were a kid, and to college students, to everybody. And it's like, okay. I, you know, I wasn't sure about that idea because, you know, basically it's a, it's a movie for families. So, but I was like, okay, cool. And, yeah, they shot all kinds of stuff that was – you know, a little racy or drug references, um, sexuality, uh, just lots of things. And then we previewed it in Arizona. I think it was Scottsdale, Arizona. And the parents in the audience reacted very badly. First of all, it was a very conservative audience. Mm. And one of the things that really surprised us, so the movie, the plot of the movie was um, demons from outer space are collecting the souls of college students <laughs> in order to form a giant soul vat and suck down like the ultimate monster from space, uh, their leader or whatever, I don't even remember. <laughs> so one of the things that came out of that preview was that people were very offended by the use of the word demon and the use of the word soul because of the religious connotations. After like Velma and Daphne get possessed by demons. They get kind of slutty and their like costumes get like lower cuts. So there's some cleavage showing and um, there's also a whole subplot of Velma kind of lusting after Daphne. Uh, there's a, there was a scene uh, when they're flying to Spooky Island 
where uh, Daphne's putting her luggage up in the luggage rack and Fred and Velma are sitting next to each other and they're both ogling her, you know? And there's a scene where it's on, it's on the outtakes in the DVD, but there's a scene where Velma thinks she's drunk and she does a song in the bar. Mm -hmm. You're just too good to be true. We had two yeah. versions of the scene. We had the naughty version and the nice version. The naughty version, she's looking at Fred and, and uh, Daphne, and Daphne says to Fred, is she singing to you or to me? And then uh, later in the sequence, Velma takes off her top and throws it away. She's wearing like this stupid bra. But, um, you know, it was like racy. And uh, that wasn't going to fly. <laughs> um, so we had to... Anytime anybody said the word demon, we had to change it to creature. Mm. Anytime anybody said the word soul, we had to change it to protoplasm. <laughs> so we, we did that by, if someone's about to say the word demon, we cut to the back of their head. And mm -hmm. do you guys mm. know what ABR is? Yeah. So when you replace the dialogue with something else. So we would cut to the back of their head and put in protoplasm. So <laughs> demons are, you know, the creatures are, that kind of thing mm -hmm. and cutting around a lot of that. And we had to uh, CG the, cl the, uh, the clothing higher. So <laughs> there was no cleavage or less cleavage. Mm -hmm. um, we had to, what else did we do? I don't know. There were some stupid drug jokes that we took out. Like there's a scene where uh, Shaggy and Scooby are in a van and there's like mm -hmm. smoke coming out of the van yeah. and the guy comes up and he, and he looks and there's like a sign that says pot five dollars and then it pans down to just like a flower pot but we had to take that out <laughs> and, uh, yeah there's a, like um when they first arrive at the dock Mondavaria says something about possession which we had to take out and fred used to say um the only possession these kids need to worry about is when they go back through customs and, uh, yeah, things like that, you know. Yeah. There's a scene where Velma's drunk, or she thinks she's, thinks she's drunk at the bar, and she goes, Scooby-Doo! Do is another word for poop. Your name is Scooby-Poop. <laughs> that was in the trailer. They kept that yeah. in the trailer. Really? Mm-hmm. That's funny. So anyway, yeah, that was, it was a process like that. That's it, it was, right. It was, not surprising but still kind of disappointing and the studio was very worried so we had to you know make those changes it's really interesting what you're saying and there's still like a lot of evidence out there for things so for example on some of the really early merchandise for the scooby-doo movie like it's not the fully cgi edited outfits and you almost see a progression through some of the merchandise that was released alongside the movie as well yeah in the movie scrapbook it says that in that kind of time gap shaggy and scooby have been selling pots like they've been doing pottery <laughs> and so that's uh -huh. like the only hint of that they kept it in the book yeah. but like you say in the movie nowhere to be seen like, Interesting. and also in the book it mentions um the scrapbook for it mentions Daphne being more like a racy style character, doesn't it? Yeah. And again, the outfits kind of evolve as the merch had been released like further since the movie's release and that kind of thing. In the in the woods where they're exchanging souls, you know, or exchanging protoplasm. Uh, <laughs> uh, it used to be like, you know, like, let's see, Fred is in Daphne's body and Daphne's in Fred's body, and Fred, as Daphne says, he's touching my boobies. And then we cut to Daphne, and she's like poking your breasts. And, and then um, in, in the final exchange of souls, Shaggy is Shaggy, Fred is Fred, but Delma and, Delma and Daphne are still reversed. So Daphne says, um, you know, uh, Shaggy, Fred, cover your mouth. And she goes up to Daphne and gives her a big kiss. You know, she like, it's like a swooning kind of romantic kiss. And that's how they exchange souls and get and get back mm. to being each other. But that's gone. It sounds like there was a lot that was like taken out. And even though like it is a shame, like some of the like jokes and references and things like that that was taken out, I think it all came together really well. And it's still such a memorable movie. And you've spoken a little bit about some of the scenes that were deleted. <clears throat> and um notably one of the original endings was with the lunar ghost being revealed as the main villain. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, he wasn't actually the main villain, but at the end, uh, when they're you know revealing what happened in the crowd, watching it is the guy, old man Smithers, who was a Luna Ghost. He's like, hmm, you know, and then he walks over to the helicopter, but that's all you see. So it's just kind of like a mm-hmm. little hint. But mm-hmm. that's it. he's not really like the main bad guy. He's just kind of like, ooh, what's he up to? You know, that kind of thing. And, and Scrappy Doo, as the door of the helicopter is closing, used to say, you know, I would have gotten away with this if it wasn't for you, son of a... And then the door closes. I mean, there's just so many. Like, honestly, I think we could, like, sit here for hours and say about, like, okay, please go through all the details <laughs> of all the deleted scenes. Yeah. I want to piece this together in my mind. But that is absolutely incredible. And I guess on that theme, I'd like to ask you, was there a scene that was almost the hardest to delete? Not necessarily for, like, oh, this is a shame to delete it, but more like, if you get rid of this, then it's difficult to form the rest of the story around. No, not really. I mean, most of what we cut was just, was jokes and, you know, sort of racy or off-color jokes or whatever. Um, The scene, it's on the the deleted scenes on the DVD, the scene where um, Daphne gets possessed was a really good scene and kind of hated to lose that. But I think it was too scary and maybe too suggestive, so we had to lose it. But it didn't, didn't really hurt the story per se, but it was just a really cool scene, you know. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of James Gunn, obviously, <laughs> that, you know, we had to tone down. But then he, he wrote the second one, too. So, you know, there mm-hmm. you go. Thank you so much. And another thing that this movie is kind of renowned for at this point is the amazing soundtrack, be it the composition by David Newman or songs from like the likes of Shaggy and the Baha Men. Um, as an editor, were you in charge of where these songs were placed or did you have any input in the kind of musical aspect of things? Yeah, usually um, when I do my first cut, I'll put in all the music as well, the temporary music. And I worked. I had worked with David a lot at that point, so I was. I tend to use his scores from other movies as temporary music, and then in terms of songs, we tend we put in what we think really works well. But then it's just a question of can we afford this? You know, a lot of songs are super expensive, so um, uh, you know, there's a scene in uh, the locker room with Velma. It's in the outtakes on the DVD where she's been possessed. And the original song was, I think, Insane in the Membrane. And mm. I'm not sure what ended up there on the DVD outtake. It was something different. But yeah, so basically, it depends on the movie. On Scooby, not so much. On other movies, I've had a lot of input to music that stays in the movie. But Scooby, not so much. I guess on the movie soundtrack, um, on the CD that was released, there was a song by Kylie Minogue kylie minogue which was whenever you feel like it but it's not in the movie do you remember if it was originally going to be part of the film if it was in one of the scenes that had to be deleted no i I don't think it was ever in the movie i mean i could be wrong about that but i don't have a memory of it being in uh i don't know if they did that because she's australian and they wanted to you know include her or I'm, i'm not really sure And i guess as well do you have a favorite moment from working on the movie well, I mean, the filming in general, just being on those sets was just so magical. And, and, and yeah, traveling around various parts of Australia was fantastic. It's such a great country. And then uh, the post-production was fun, except for, you know, after that first preview where we had to, like, really rethink the movie. Um, but, you know, that was its own kind of challenge. And, and it goes to show how much can be done in the editing room in terms of rewriting and rethinking and still coming up with a good movie, even though it wasn't the movie you set out to make, it's it's still good on its own, you know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'd say my favorite part was the filming, and that was true for, uh, I think, the second one as well, yeah. Nice. And did you get to attend the movie premiere? Probably, but I do not remember. I've been to, I usually go to the premieres, but I don't remember that one. Mm-hmm. So, sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> So with all, you know, the pieces that have been cut and everything, um, a lot of the fans have kind of, like, hoped that maybe, especially with Anniversary, you know, around the 20th, like maybe a director's cut would be released or something. Um, Do you know if, like, they still have that footage or if they're just, like, deleted at this point? Well, unfortunately, because it was such a scramble with our VFX people Mm -hmm. to change a lot of these things, 
the only people that might have some of those things would be the VFX house. And unfortunately, mm. Rhythm and Hughes, who did the movie, no longer exist. Oh. So probably not. I mean, I have like yeah. a, I have a whole reel of outtakes that I saved, but those are just really crappy quality, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, unfortunately, probably not. Yeah. It would be great. It would be, I'd love to see that movie. Me we too, would do. Right? <laughs> uh, there's only a limited number of things that I wouldn't give to see that version of the film because it just sounded yeah. wow. <laughs> it does sound so fun. It was really fun. It was fun. Yep. Hopefully, in some miracle, like somehow, we'll be able to see it one day. Hey, and... You never know. You never know. Yeah. So... I mean, I, I'm a member of the Academy, and, and I've been giving them all of my memorabilia and different you know, whatever things from movies I've worked on, and I gave them all the Scooby outtakes that I had and everything. So who knows? Who knows? <laughs> so I guess that's leading on to the next question. To your knowledge, are you aware of any official plans that may be in like process to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the movie? No, I haven't, but maybe your podcast will help kick that off. I hope so. And we hope just something. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> We've got a lot planned to celebrate, like mm -hmm. between the four of us. I mean, JB and Millie, like, I, I just want to quickly take a moment. They're working their butts off to just make <laughs> get us the best guests. And I mean, they got you on here, and it's amazing. And you're, you're an incredible guest. So thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So I guess, um, even you know, it's 20th anniversary, so many people still love this movie. and. What would you like to say to the fans who still love your work after all of this time? I really enjoy, you know, I mean, I don't revisit my movies after I've finished them usually, but in order to uh, talk to you guys, I looked at the first two movies again today and, you know, I really enjoy what we did. I think that they're very entertaining and I, I see why people respond to them so well. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy with, with the way they turned out. So, yeah. So I suppose, um, like you've mentioned, you did in fact do the two Scooby-Doo movies, of course the second one being Monsters Unleashed. Now how did, uh, if any, if any, did the editing process or going into the editing process for the second one differ from the first one? It was completely different because they knew not to, you know, make the movie they thought they were making for the first one. <laughs> they knew that, you know, what their audience was, they had a better grasp of it. So it went much, much more smoothly. And, um, you know, it was just really fun with all those different monsters and all the different, you know, VFX and the, the chases and the, you know, the two skeletons, you know, going down the hill on the garbage can lids. All that stuff was so much fun to put together. And um, we shot that one in Vancouver. And again, Bill Bowes did the amazing sets and, the, you know, incredible costumes and a really good cast. So, uh, yeah, that was a pleasure and it was... Uh, a much smoother process. And of course, um, like we've mentioned before with deleted scenes, I think in the bonus features of the DVD for the sequel, there's like this really fun sequence where these two security guards are kind of messing around in the museum, zapping each other, and then the 10,000 volt ghost shows up. But are there any deleted scenes that you can think of that people may not know about? Nothing comes to mind. I mean, the reason like that scene was cut out was just because we didn't want to believe it's because we didn't want to reveal that monster too soon and you know it's just a question of being economical with the storytelling as well and focusing more on the characters as opposed to side characters um so no i can't really think of anything that we took out that you know was anything that anyone would miss see i think this movie was absolutely amazing and all the villains and everything to be incorporated the way they were and on such a scale as well was amazing do you have any favorite edits from doing this movie Hmm. Well, I used to really enjoy the sequence where uh, Shaggy and Scooby um, accidentally make the monsters, you know? <laughs> and speaking of music, I used a, a piece of music from David Newman's movie. Uh, I think it was 101 Dalmatians that he did. And it was a, it was a Krill DeVille kind of theme. <laughs> and I cut the scene to that. And it was so cool. It was like really eerie and, and kind of majestic and spooky. And, and the way those monsters looked was so much fun. So... Um, yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of the final cut, I mean, uh, just 
all those action sequences are, are really fun to watch. And, you know, that kind of challenge where, again, you have characters that aren't there and you're cutting a scene, a chase or whatever it is, and you have to map it out. It's, it's, it's a challenge and it's really fun. And also, you know, the collaborative aspects working with the people at Rhythm and Hughes and Betsy, Betsy Patterson and some other people there, uh, you know, just coordinating with them as to what was doable, what wasn't doable, et cetera. Really interesting process, you know, and, and you know, time consuming, <laughs> takes, takes a while. I imagine so. And also, um, I think my last question for you, if that's okay, is, um, you know, the community were kind of made aware that there was the intentions to do a third live action Scooby movie. Um, do you know, were you kind of, to what end that kind of progressed? Like, was it at a stage where you'd been contacted about doing that? Because obviously, you know, you'd done the first two. Do you know if there was plans to have you edit the third one? The, the third one didn't happen because the second one didn't perform as well as the first one. Mm -hmm. So the studio got cold feet. They did eventually do, you know, the animated Scoob with two <laughs> of the same producers. And they did call me about that at one point, but um, I was busy doing something else. And that kind of went on for a really long time, that movie. And I never saw it. Did you guys see it? Yeah. yeah. How is it? Very different. It's it's it's, it's, yeah. it's it's nice. It's like a nice Scooby superhero blend. Kind yeah, of it's more, more of a superhero. More modern movie. ages, whereas like I think with the two thousand two two thousand four movie, that's going to be the type of thing that I'm going to end up watching into my yeah. late eighties. So. Yeah, I don't <laughs> well, know. There's just something about the live actions as well, and it was the first time they'd it had ever been seen as a live action. Scooby was a really nicely established cartoon and it just hadn't been done before, so. They feel like time pieces of that mm -hmm. era. Yeah. yeah, very much so, yeah, it's true. It's really interesting to think about, you know, how CG has evolved and, you know, like if you look at whatever, like King Kong or, you know, an old movie and it's like, well, it's really obvious. <laughs> I'm wondering, you know, I guess, like if you look at some of the early Spider-Man movies, it's pretty obvious where the CG turns on and you know, the character turns into a CG character. Um, and it takes me out of the movie a little bit. Um, I think with the Scooby movies, it's like, well, you know, it's a <laughs> CG character. We're not trying to fool you into thinking, you know, <laughs> Spider-Man flying through the canyons or whatever. So I think that might have, that helps a, a bit in terms of the entertainment of it all, because you know yeah. what you're watching and you just go with it, hopefully. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. And I do think the behind the scenes movie for that uh, for that movie was just as intriguing as the movie itself. Like mm -hmm. the bonus features again, like there was a scene where somebody had dressed up fully in green with the um dress over them to walk through the airport to be Scooby. Yeah. And yeah. you know, there was things where there were, you know, um I think Rowan Atkinson was saying as well, like he was just getting told to like, he was just getting people pointing to him like Scooby's there, Scooby's there. Now he's facing this way. And it's just so interesting to hear how creative they were. Um, there was two live action Scooby movies a little bit later on that I think were kind of more just TV releases. And they just had this huge like Scooby, like teddy bear <laughs> that was just lying down through half of it. So they knew where that was that we've seen in the deleted scenes as well. That's funny. Did the uh, deleted scenes have the guy on the plane wearing the dress and the green collar? I, Ooh, I don't think that they show that much, but it has recently been like surfacing online. I don't know how too recent it has, but definitely there's that kind of, kind of face mask and everything. Yeah, I yeah. think I remember seeing some of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah lots of tricks, lots of tricks. <laughs> One thing they do too is hold up a mirror ball because it would reflect the set you know, and that would really help them with the CG and the, and the, the modeling and the angles and all, things like that, which I'm sure that is not done anymore. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's lots of tricks. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's kind of all the questions we have with Scooby Wise, but um, kind of just for future wise for you, are there any projects that you are hoping you could work on or any studios that you haven't worked with before that you'd like to? Yeah. Um, you see that I have a low battery. Uh oh. And plug this in before I lose you guys. Perfect. You're good. No problem. <laughs> um, I've been um, kind of alternating recently between live action and animation. So the last movie I did that was 
live action was with Billy Crystal, a movie called Here Today. Came out um, last year at, during the pandemic. And um, I did two Angry Birds movies for Sony. Mm. Yeah. Which were, which were really fun. And here I am back with it. And uh, I really enjoyed working with Sony because they're such such good people and very filmmaker friendly. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping to do something with them again. They have a couple of really interesting sounding projects in the works that they're trying to get off the ground. And uh, so we'll see. I mean, you know, I freelance, and that's what I've been doing my entire career. So you never really know, you know, what's mm -hmm. going to come up. But uh, hopefully something fun. Perfect. And usually it is. So, yeah. There you go. Yep. <laughs> Anything else I can tell you guys? Um, just if, oh, go ahead. No, no, sorry. I just like I just again. I'm, I just want to thank you so much for being on here today. Like, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just incredible. Yeah, it's yeah. been incredible. Thank you so much. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. So, was there anything anybody else wanted to ask before we wrapped up at all? I don't think, I think we so. covered it for now. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I do have one last question, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so also watching the bonus features of the 2002 movie, I think it was Rajar Gosnell was talking about a sequence that was deleted just before the scene where Velma was meant to have her kind of sing song where Fred and Daphne were perhaps trying to rekindle a relationship. Um, yeah. Can you tell us about that scene, please? Yeah, they, were, uh, they had adjoining hotel rooms. I don't know if that's in the movie anymore. And um, Fred uh, was hoping to, you know, spend the night with her. And she's like, why are you holding your toothbrush? And, and you know, he's like, I'm here to protect you. You know, you always get so scared. And she's like, I don't get scared. And he's like, what do you mean when the cheese ball ghost grabbed you? And, and she, then she goes, oh, help, help. You know, I was just pretending. And, she, and then she, and she goes, and that's not the only thing I faked. <laughs> so. Oh, no. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh i really incredible. do wish we could see the the full version of the movie i guess <laughs> a question i had for you kind of on the amount of things that had to be removed did it change the duration of the movie a lot i know sometimes there's kind of a time scale of what people want to try and achieve for it to be in the cinema to be a certain duration or something like that did having to take so much out present a like challenge with time no i mean to me, an ideal comedy length is, you know, 90 minutes or 88 minutes. And um, I really don't understand these two and a half hour, three hour movies. <laughs> these days. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, really? we've spent nearly four hours in a cinema for uh, Marvel before, I think, haven't we, JB? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, if you can justify it, that's cool. But it tends to wear us welcome. So, but anyway, no, I mean, you know, uh, we had to make radical changes that we didn't anticipate on the first movie, but. It's still, we still always have the intention of, you know, making it as shapely as possible and as entertaining as possible and, you know, working on its own terms um, as what it is. So, no, the, the length wasn't affected because it wasn't like we had to, like, take out, like, major plot points. We just had to alter them, you know? Right. So, yeah. That's amazing. Thank you so, so much. Just honestly, you've been an incredible guest. It's been so amazing to speak with you because... This is a movie that we've all been so nostalgic for for such a long time. And I feel like we get to see it in a new light and in a new way, especially yeah. after this. So thank you so, so much. Okay, so in addition to the questions asked in this interview, we also wanted to know a little bit more about the scene with the Coast Guards, because I think for us that maybe was something we needed more context on, and also the rumoured scene that was to include the Pentagon. So we asked Kent Bader if they'd be willing to provide some extra information on this, which they very kindly did. So we're going to play that for you now. In the original cut of the movie, we had a cutaway to the Pentagon where one of the officers working there was possessed by a demon, aka creature. And we also had cutaways to the Coast Guard possessed by demons. Uh, they were all dancing at the Pentagon and at the Coast Guard to the demon chant when they're all rallying at the end of the movie. But we decided to keep the focus on the island for the most part. So therefore we got rid of those pieces. Awesome. That's great. Okay. 
Thank you so much. That's great. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for listening as well. As always, links to social media and things to follow will be in the description below. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.